I'm Lawrence Masterin, this is Zane Alizadi. Our project is the Automatic Super Mario Brothers player. The goal of our project was to create a program that will automatically play through the first level of Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES. The program guides Mario forward through the level and makes him jump whenever it detects that Mario is too close to an obstacle or an enemy. This program is coded in Python using the OpenCV library and is connected to our NES controller using an Arduino microcontroller. The OpenCV library of Python allows us to receive and manipulate video from a USB device, such as a webcam. We chose, however, not to use a webcam because it's too imprecise. There would be a reflection and screen glare, and there would be a problem adjusting the camera angle. So instead, we used an EasyCap capture card. <clears throat> it has um, it has composite video and audio. Uh, it has plugs for video, composite video and audio, and that allows us to receive the signal directly from the NES. And instead of plugging in the red, white, and yellow cables into a TV, we plugged into the capture card, and we plugged the capture card into the computer via USB. And this allowed for consistency every time we tried. <clears throat> All right. Uh, we, we when we first uh, we then began to track Mario on the game screen. We first applied a slight blur, which we we applied a slight blur, which was used to reduce the video noise, and then we scaled the image to speed up the process, speed up the program. <clears throat> After the blur, we used HSV thresholding. HSV stands for Hue, Saturation, Value. In thresh, uh, each pixel on the screen can be defined by HSV. In thresholding, we search for a pixel that matched the range of the color that we were looking for. To track Mario, we, track the, we search for the red on his hat and the red on his overalls. We then use erosion to get rid of the excess white pixels that are in the HSV threshold, because as you can see, they're not part of Mario. We get rid of the excess white pixels and then recombine the object using dilation and then find the center of the object in order to find the coordinates of Mario. We then tracked other objects that Mario needed to avoid. We used the same method that we used to track Mario. However, we used a color that was unique to each of the objects we were trying to avoid. For a pipe, for instance, we would find the green. For enemies, we would use a white. To track pits, we would we would track only we would search only the bottom half of the screen and we would search for blue. We then had to figure out a way to control our NES controller with an Arduino. We soldered wires to the 5 volt pin, ground pin, and each button pin on the controller, and we connected the wires for the for the button pins to the digital pins on our Arduino. This allowed us to simulate pressing a button and releasing a button by changing the state of the digital pins on the Arduino. Setting the pin to be an input would press the button, and setting the pin to be an output would release the button. The NES controller uses a CD4021 shift register to pull the states of every button on the controller and send the data to the NES. Each button pin on the shift register is normally pulled high. When the controller receives a five-fold signal from the NES console, if a button is not being pressed, the signal goes to the corresponding button pin on the shift register, and the data is outputted to the NES, and the NES is told that the button is being released. When the, put, when the button is pressed, the signal is instead grounded, and the signal, or rather the pin on the shift register is pulled low. As a result, when the data is sent to the NES, it sends the data as a button being pressed. So when we connect the button pins to our Arduino, when we want to press a button, we have to set it as an input pin because that would have the same effect as grounding the pin. As a result, the pin on the shift register will be pulled low and the, rec the NES will recognize that the button is being pressed. When we want to release the button, we then set the Arduino pin to be an output pin. That will have the same effect as not pressing the button and as a result, the button pin on the shift register is pulled high and the data is outputted to the NES as a button being released. This is a picture of how we soldered the buttons on the controller. And this is a picture of our full connection scheme. We created a custom connection bridge for ease with connecting and disconnecting so that we would not have to connect the wires one at a time. We then used serial communication so that we could tell our Arduino when to press and release the buttons. The Arduino uses serial communication to send one character messages and receive one character messages from an outside source such as Mario Player. 
Mario Player uses Pi Serial to send these specific messages to the Arduino. It is able to send a specific message to press or release different buttons like the right button, the start button, and the jump button. By using this in conjunction with the tracking program, we are able to tell Mario to jump whenever he gets too close to an object or an enemy. When we first started tracking Mario, we had Mario perform, perform a full jump. This posed a problem. When Mario reaches the bottom of this staircase, he performs a full jump, but he runs into the high, he runs into the block, which halts his speed. When Mario performs another full jump, because of the loss of speed, he's unable to make it across the pit, and he dies as a result. To fix this, we changed, we changed it so that Mario makes short jumps, and he moves slower on the staircase, so he jumps one block at a time. This, however, created another problem. When Mario makes it past the first staircase, he lands in the center, and because he was making short jumps, he would be unable to make it across the second staircase. To fix this, we started tracking the highest block on the screen. Then, in front of when a block is tracked, and there's another block on top of it, Mario performs a full jump instead. However, our biggest problem was with this group of four enemies. We originally made Mario do a medium-sized jump whenever he detected an enemy. As a result, Mario would jump over the first two enemies, land between the two groups, and then jump over the second group of enemies. This did work sometimes, but the problem was that any sort of lag in either the controller, or the Arduino, or the capture card, or our program, would cause Mario to detect the Goomba too late, and as a result, Mario would run into it and die. Now, we make Mario do a full jump whenever he detects that he is extremely close to this first enemy. It's still a little bit risky, but in our test, it proved to be much more consistent than jumping between the two groups. All right, this is a final rundown of our program. Mar the program starts the game automatically, and Mario moves forward. The program consistently checks with how close Mario is in relation to other objects. When Mario becomes too close to an object, he performs a jump for a specific amount of time, which allows for a certain jump height. When Mario comes close to a staircase, he performs the small jumps and he moves slowly. For other objects, he performs a full jump. However, despite these optimizations, there are still a few problems with Mario Player. The HSV tracking and erosion that we use is sometimes a little too aggressive, and as a result, small objects like enemies and blocks are sometimes not tracked. However, this only happens when the screen is in a certain position and doesn't happen very often. Our biggest, program, or our biggest problem with the program is with lag. There's lag in receiving the video from the NES console because it must be converted from an analog signal to a digital signal by the capture card. Additionally, HSV tracking is not the fastest way to track, so it prevents our program from running at the full 60 frames per second that our NES console runs at. Finally, connecting our computer to the projector adds a, a little bit more lag because my computer and running this program doesn't exactly make the best combination. As a result, the program only has about an 85% success rate. So we have a demo of how our program runs. We had to set this all up last minute and hopefully it will work. You can see there is a small control overlay on the top right of the screen and it's able to start the level automatically. It moves Mario forward and when it detects that Mario gets too close to an enemy, it jumps. As you can see, for objects other than a block, it is able to do a full jump, and we also made it detect when it's on top of a pipe to do another jump. It's able to detect when there are pits on the bottom of the ground and jump accordingly, and it is also able to detect the Koopa as well. This is the problem spot we were talking about, but as you can see, it was able to get past that group of four Roombas, and it now crosses the staircase. That was the other problem spot we were talking about, and it was able to get out of the space between the two staircases. Finally, it jumps over the last group of Goombas and jumps over the final staircase, approximately one block at a time, and it's able to get to the final flagpole and complete the level. Oh, wow. Wow. Here, we'd like to reduce more lag so the program can run more consistently. Additionally, we'd like to add features such as finding power-ups on the map. And lastly, and most importantly, we'd like to extend the program to complete more levels. These are our sources. Are there any questions? No questions? It's better than my seven-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> It is time to break the lunch.